Welcome everybody to the second webinar in our monthly fall series hosted by the Celiac Center at Harvard Medical School and the National Celiac Association. I'm Lee Graham, Executive Director of the National Celiac Association, founded in 1993. It's appropriate today, since we are talking about food and Thanksgiving, to let you know about NCA's latest program. Our gluten-free community has not been able to find food assistance in their local food pantries. So NCA, with the help of many of you, who have delivered $335,000 worth of food to food pantries in 25 states. I hope you will consider helping us this time of need by visiting our website, nationalceliac.org, to help expand our reach from 25 to 50 states. Thank you. For today, you are welcome to ask general questions through the Q&A feature, which is located on the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen. We will not be taking personal medical or nutritional questions. If you still are struggling to connect with us, tech support is, avail is available if needed at the phone number 857-282-6470. Or email digital media at partners.org. Also, this session is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the NCA website, nationalceliac.org. I'm especially excited to introduce to you today Denise Barron Herrera. She began as an executive chef and is now the vice president of operations for Burton's Grill and Bar. She received an AOS in Culinary Arts in 1995 and a BS in Food Service Management in 1998 from Johnson & Wales University. In 2004, she partnered to help create the Contemporary American Grill concept. Chef Herrera is an active member of the Massachusetts Restaurant Association's Executive Board, along with being a member of the Boston chapter of Les Dames d'Escoffier. Chef Herrera was one of 16 people selected to participate in an inaugural culinary enrichment and innovation program, a culinary leadership program from the Culinary Institute of America and Hormel Foods. She also helped launch a pilot program, Esperanza Cooks, The Recipe for Life, and has been featured in television and in print. She debuted on the local TV stations for cooking demonstrations such as TV Diner, and the Phantom Gourmet. And her largest television accomplishment was on the Food Network Chopped as a chef competition where she finished as a runner up. So without further ado, welcome Chef Denise. Thank you Lee for the wonderful introduction. I wanna thank the National Celiac Association along with the Harvard Medical School Celiac Research Program for inviting me to participate today. I also wanna thank Trimark United East for allowing us to use this wonderful presentation kitchen in their innovation center. I'll never forget the, face, the, the faces on my parents when I went to tell them that I was going to be a chef. I think that their jaws dropped and they said, really, is this really what you wanna do? And it's been almost 30 years and I honestly can say, I love what I do. I have so much passion for the food industry um, and I'm really happy that I get to share it with you today. Today, I will be presenting um, recipes that originally started at Burton's Grill 15 years ago as gluten recipes. And over the years, we have modified and changed our practices to be um, inclusive of gluten-free ingredients so that we can take any of the guesswork or any of the cross-contamination out of the kitchen. So we really, um, as we look to feed the masses, we're very mindful of the ingredients that we use to make sure that we can have a safe dining experience for our allergy-friendly um, guests as well. So today I'm going to be demonstrating our gluten-free pumpkin bread pudding, our crab stuffed mushrooms with gluten-free breadcrumbs, our gluten-free croutons, and I'll be making a gluten-free roux um, uh, and a velouté, which is a thickened stock. And that's gonna springboard you into gravies and soups and a whole other wonderful world of recipes that you can experiment and play with. So on to cooking, let's have some fun today. So we're gonna start with a gluten-free bread pudding. And um, this is an item that, you know, what I wanted to show you today is I know gluten-free bread can be very expensive. And I want you to understand that whenever you have ends of breads or leftover of bread um, and you don't wanna throw it away, put it in a um, Ziploc bag and store it in your freezer, okay? 
because as you accumulate it, you can make a wide variety of recipes to include bread puddings for dessert, croutons, um, and breadcrumbs. So being the holiday season, I thought it would be very appropriate to share our gluten-free pumpkin bread pudding. So it starts with four eggs, one and a quarter cup sugar plus two tablespoons. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to mix this bread, this, these ingredients together because what I find is when I add additional dried spices, like the cinnamon and the ginger I'm going to add now, it helps break up the clumps. Because um, sometimes as you're working with liquids and you put dry seasonings in it, you can see the seasonings clump together. So this little trick allows the sugar to, to kind of break up all of those little pieces of dried seasoning. I'm going to add our pumpkin. Now this recipe calls for a half a cup of pumpkin. So I understand when you buy a whole can of pumpkin, you say, well, what am I gonna do with the rest of that? Well, again, being the holiday season, if you take your leftover pumpkin and you mix it with a little bit of milk and maybe some pumpkin pie spice, um, you can then make it into a wonderful cocktail called a pumpkin pie martini. And you can add a vanilla vodka to it and all of your guests will be very excited, as will you. Um, I would also garnish that with a cinnamon sugar rim on that martini glass. So I'm also gonna add my vanilla extract and my two cups of heavy cream. Now, we use heavy cream at the restaurant. Some people can substitute milk in there um, if they choose to. I like the heavy cream because it kind of creates that creme brulee, really rich flavor profile that I'm going for. And I'm gonna mix this up until everything's nicely incorporated. Now, as we um, have experimented over time with this recipe, we have realized that the, it is really important to allow your bread time to soak, okay? If you don't allow the bread the time to soak, you won't absorb those flavors. And as um, we in the gluten-free community have experienced, gluten-free bread can be very, very dense. So what we do is we take this bread and we coat it really well. And I'm using um, a burger bun just because that's what we have readily available in our restaurants. But you can mix and match this. Um, we've used uh, wheat bread, we've used plain bread. I wouldn't use any breads that have like a seed if you were to, to get a gluten-free rye bread in here. Um, that's just gonna put a little bit of an off flavor. So I would really focus on the bread that has um, kind of more neutral flavors. So in the wonderful world of cameras, we're going to wait that two hours and we will have a nice soaked bread pudding. So you turn this bread pudding over every 30 minutes in that two hour time to really make sure all those pieces get nice and absorbed. Now, the one thing you don't wanna do is work it too much because as we also know about gluten-free bread, it's delicate, it can be crumbly. So especially if we're working with it out of the frozen state, you wanna make sure that the bread pudding um, doesn't just become really soupy and crumbly for you. So, I am going to take my dried cranberries. Now you can add as many dried cranberries or as little dried cranberries as you like. I've gone with a quarter cup and I like to take the majority of them and put them through my bread, my bread pudding. Now I'm gonna take an eight by eight baking pan and I had just bought an aluminum one at the store because um, this is great for if you're going to a friend's house or you're traveling or you're going somewhere. Um, you don't have to leave your own pie pan. So this is a great, great way. I like to use a little bit of a spray. Now, whenever you spray, remember that this spray is going to make the floor very slippery. So just be very careful about that. Okay. Now I'm gonna take my bread pudding and I'm going to turn it out into my pan. And I'm looking for even distribution of my liquid and my bread. 
Denise, do you think that um, the gluten-free versions taste pretty much the same as the regular ones? Yes, I, you know, this is probably my sixth time I've made this bread pudding for this demonstration. So my kids have been eating it and they love it. <laughs> they have no idea. <laughs> so um, we serve this in our restaurant and not once has anybody said, wow, that doesn't taste like it has gluten in it. So I think that with the flavored cream and the sugar and everything else and the way that we have worked with this recipe to ensure that it is um, really well soaked um, has really helped create a very delicious dish. Then I'm gonna take my cranberries and I'm just gonna speckle them over top so that it creates a little bit of color and presentation as I'm going to cook. Now I'm going to be using a convection oven today and I understand that not everybody has convection ovens in their houses. So what I would say is if you don't have a convection oven, turn your oven up about 15 degrees and then just start the, the um, doneness checking at the time that I put on the recipe, which is 30 minutes. So then I'm just gonna lightly press down my bread pudding. I had a question come in from somebody who said, what kind of bread did you use again? She didn't quite catch that. I used a burger bun on this one. Okay. So what I have found that if I was to use a sliced white bread, um, it's almost too thin and wimpy and it doesn't hold up to the soaking and, and making the bread pudding. So that's why I do choose to use a burger bun on this one. I'm going to put this into my 300 degree oven. And I'm gonna set my timer for 30 minutes. So while that's cooking, we can move over to our next recipe. And if you, uh, can you see right here, we do have the bread pudding on display um, that I cooked. This is also another really great recipe that you can cook um, the day ahead of the, um, the big event that you're going to, whether it's Thanksgiving or a friend's house. Um, it holds up really well um, in the refrigerator overnight. It actually helps set it. And then the next day you can dump it out of your pan, slice it, present it on a nice tray and bring it over. Um, if you like to keep, eat it warm, you can pop it back in the oven and warm it back up at 450 degrees for about you know, eight to 10 minutes. What we'll be making next is our gluten-free breadcrumbs. So again, we understand that gluten-free bread is expensive. So um, I have looked at the stores on how much you can pay for a little eight ounce jar of gluten-free breadcrumbs. And I scratch my head and say, okay, well, if you have bread ends at home, absolutely save it. Because this is a great recipe that you can then um, make it, freeze it, and put it in your oven. Now I'm making a breadcrumb today that is going to be used to stuff a crab stuffing. As we're talking about the holidays and Thanksgiving, you can also make a breadcrumb that you can use to make your holiday stuffing. Um, it really just depends on the size of the bread and how you process that in your food processor. So the breadcrumbs that I've processed today, I have three cups of finely processed bread, which you can see right in here. And comparatively, next to it in this black bowl, I also um, put some bread that's not as finely processed. Now this is what I would use to make my stuffing for the holidays. And then this is what I would use to thicken or, or um, use breadcrumbs for uh, dredging chicken in for you know, chicken parmesan or eggplant parmesan. I would also use this um, for my crab cakes, just to give you some ideas. And I'm making a generic, um, breadcrumb and Italian styled. You can flavor this any which way that you choose to. Um, but for me, I just like to have a more neutral flavor on my base breadcrumb so I can take it into a lot of different, you know, directions. Now, I have staled this bread overnight um, and I, I break it up into smaller pieces and I stale it out. Now, if I'm trying to make breadcrumbs on the fly, I will then cut my bread just like this, put it on a sheet tray and pop it in a uh, 300 degree oven and just dry it out for about four to six minutes, depending upon how fresh that bread is. Or you can just leave it out overnight and um, it'll stale that way as well for a couple days. 
So then I put this in my food processor and I process it to the doneness that I'm looking for. Now, the most important thing when you're adding food to your food processor is you don't overfill your bowl. If you overfill your bowl, you're gonna have an uneven distribution of fine, fine breadcrumbs and really, you know, coarse breadcrumbs. So in here, I'm going to add my one tablespoon of olive oil. And you don't want a lot of olive oil in this aspect of it because you're, you're really just trying to add a little bit of moisture into that bread to help toast it up. Denise, there was another question that came in probably on the bread pudding was, is a regular oven to be increased by 15 degrees or 50 degrees? One, one five, 15. One five. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. So now I'm just kind of working the, the olive oil into the bread. Again, I don't want to super saturate this. That, that's not what I'm going for here. And then I'm going to use dried oregano and dried basil. Now, when I use my um, dried herbs, I like to pinch my herbs and squeeze them over the bread or over whatever I'm using um, because that really helps, um, you know, activate them and, and really enhance their flavors. So I'm adding my dried oregano and dried basil. I'm just gonna mix that around. And I'll take my sheet tray and I'll spread that out on my sheet tray here. Just move it all over to all the different corners. Now this is gonna go into a 300 degree oven. And you're gonna see me putting all of the food in the same oven. This is a really cool piece of technology that they have here that um, every level can be a different temperature. Um, it's something that we can use in the restaurants to help minimize space, but also increase efficiency. So I'm not pulling any tricks on you. It's, it's really all different temperatures. So that is going to go for about five minutes, and then I'm going to shake it, test it, and then I'm going to um, cook it again for an additional five minutes. Denise, could you use that in a larger cut to make a stuffing? Yes, and this is the cut size for the stuffing that I would recommend. So you just wouldn't process it as much, um, or you can even hand tear it if you, if you choose so. But when you're making stuffing, you really need a, a larger quantity. So I would recommend using the um, robo um, the food processor. We use a, a special one at the restaurants. I'll put this on display so you can see that there as well. Croutons. I love croutons. I snack on croutons. <laughs> I put them in my salad. I put them in my soups. I absolutely love them. And um, the way that I like to make my croutons is I like a more rustic style crouton um, where I have four cups of bread already cut up in here. And again, I have um, ends, I have burger buns, I have sliced bread. I have a wide variety in here. Now, if I had my choice and I wasn't using um, any leftover product that I didn't want to waste, my preference would be a baguette, okay? Because the baguette has the um, soft inside, but it also has the nice textured outside. So I'm looking for seven and a half cups, and I already have four cups in here. So I'm going to cut my bread in about into one inch slices. Then I'm gonna just take my hands and I'm gonna gently break them in half. Now with this size bread, I'm just gonna cut those in half with my hands. This creates a very rustic looking crouton. Now why I like the rustic croutons is because it collects all the flavor in there. So, you know, at Burton's, um, we really like to talk about flavor in every bite. Um, and flavor is really important to us as a company. We have um, a second concept called Red Heat Tavern, where their, their mantra is fire, flavor, and friends. Um, and every menu item on their menu can be prepared gluten-free as well. So same principles as Burton has taken, we really also go to that with Red Heat Tavern to make sure that everybody is accommodated. 
Did you say earlier that you had wheat bread or were you talking about just generally in the, um, in the restaurant? So in the restaurants, um, I do have um, regular bread for um, our diners, but I also carry gluten-free burger buns, gluten-free pasta. Um, I use gluten-free breadcrumbs in the restaurant. I use gluten-free flour. So over time, we have morphed. I do not carry all-purpose wheat flour in the restaurant. I do not carry any you know, wheat gluten um, breadcrumbs. That is all a gluten-free product so that we're making the same crab cakes, the same bread pudding, um, the same soups for our gluten-free guests and for our, our non-gluten-free guests. So I'm just going to continue to make these. And with croutons, um, I like to use a little bit more oil than maybe some people would think, but that's really what gives you your flavor. Um, when I talk about flavor in every bite and what we do at Burton's, we like to eat each piece of our ingredient to make sure that they have a lot of flavor in them so that when you put them together, it's really, you know, a lot of flavors happening in your mouth and, and a nice treat for you. So I'm going to add the remainder of my bread in here. Now this is the trick when you're making croutons because so many people just kind of dump the oil on and they go. But this is kind of like patting your belly and your head at the same time or rubbing your belly and patting your head. You have to shake your can, your, your, your bowl, and add your oil. And this distributes everything nice and evenly. And it kind of moves it all around. Over the years at Burton's, we've also created our own seasoning blends, uh, where we used to make them in-house, and now we have um, a company make them for us. But the crouton seasoning that I have in this recipe um, is what we've developed over time. And I've added that recipe at the bottom so you can see it. I like salt, pepper, cayenne for a little, you know, heat, granulated onion, and granulated garlic. So this was three ounces of volume of olive oil that I put on this bread. And if you can see it, it's glistening for you. Now I'm gonna add my crouton seasoning. And again, I'm going to shake my bowl. Because you don't want clumping. Shake, 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 add, add, add. And since we're gonna be garnishing this, um, gar using the croutons as a garnish for our soup, I wanted to add some herbs to it. And again, it kind of brings you to the holiday theme when you add the herbs. So I'm going to use a little dried basil, a little dried oregano, and I'm just pinching it here to activate it so that I can use my hands to shake it. Are the rolls and breads at Burton's made in the restaurant or are they ordered from a particular company? We order them from um, different vendors and, and manufacturers. Um, you know, we, we, we do make a lot, pretty much everything except for breads in our restaurant, but we do make all of our desserts um, and bread is one item that we outsource. All of our dressings, sauces, so. And I'm adding some fresh thyme. There's something about dried thyme that I just don't care for that much, um, so I always, go to a fresh time for that. And time and Thanksgiving in my mind are very symbiotic. Um, I, I really love that flavor of time during the holidays. So I'm going to put my croutons on my tray. And I'm gonna put them in the oven. And when I put them in the oven, I'm going to a 350 degree oven. I'm gonna take my breadcrumbs, shake them. As you can see, they're getting a little bit of color on them. So I'm gonna move them around. And then put them on back in. I have a question going back to the pumpkin bread or the pumpkin pudding. Yes. What about using a pumpkin bread in the pumpkin pudding? Would that be overpowering or would it be an amazingly intense flavor? So the so pumpkin bread is a quick bread where it might have a tendency to break down a little faster for you. So with that, I might say you would lightly toss it and you wouldn't get that depth of custard-like texture throughout your bread. Um, so that would be the only caution that I would say. I've never really used a quick bread in my bread pudding. Yeah. 
It may because not honestly, bread pudding is kind of like a, a, a scrap bread pudding. Um, so that's how it was developed, that people were just using the leftovers and they said, oh, let's mix all these ingredients together and make something delicious. So when you're doing the um, oven temperatures now, now, you're telling us at 325 or whatever, that would be for a regular oven or would that be a convection oven? That would be for a regular oven. Thank you. Um, the bread pudding would cook at a 300, 300 degree convection oven, high fan. Gotcha. Just gotta start my timers over here. How does Burton's handle gluten-free dinners during the holidays? Is there anything different than normal? Um, not anything different than normal because, um, you know, as I mentioned, we, we really have worked towards creating 90% um, of our menu gluten-free. You know, um, I think the only item that I wouldn't recommend on our menu right now gluten-free would be our Reuben sandwich, um, only because it is a panini press and the, the burger buns that we use um, doesn't really fit for that application. Um, but every other menu item that you get at Burton's Grill, um, we can either modify gluten-free by changing out the gluten-free buns, or we can use our gluten-free pastas. But um, our crab crusted haddock, which I'm going to show you the crab cake that I use that for the for the stuffing today, that is already naturally gluten-free. So the majority of people that come to our restaurant that don't have allergies are eating gluten-free already, and that was really the challenge for us um, is to make food taste delicious, um, no matter who's eating it. And that's really what we have set out to do so that we can accommodate a lot of different um, dietary preferences and allergies. So the croutons are in, the breadcrumbs are in, and I'm going to show you how to make the bread, um, the crab cakes or the crab stuffing. So the crab that, um, the breadcrumbs that I'm gonna use today, I made yesterday because I don't wanna use breadcrumbs that are fresh out of the oven to put into a seafood stuffing or into any stuffing just because of um, you know, temperature danger and I'm, I'm bringing up the temperature of that product. Um, so I'm gonna compromise the overall quality of it. So today, we will be making our crab cakes. There are a lot of questions coming in about the bread. They're so excited about your bread. <laughs> yeah. Is there a company that you buy these from at a wholesale or do you think they're at a retail store? So my burger buns, I believe, are only um, a wholesale product. Um, I'm not 100% sure that I see them in retail. Um, I know that there are a lot of different products out there in retail. And I also know that gluten-free bread is, is preferential. A lot of people like what they like. Um, I was using this one manufacturer, um, their burger bun, and it just was so much bread that when you're eating a burger or a fried fish sandwich, all you would taste was bread. So I have really tried to source a bread that is thinner, that when you eat it, you don't tell. So <laughs> what I normally do is I will cook a burger, put it on a gluten-free bread, um, gluten-free bun, and we toast our buns up in our salamander so they're away from any cross-contamination. And I then cut it into quarters and I start feeding it to my servers. And I said, do you like it? They're like, oh, this is great. I said, did you know that was gluten-free? They said, no. Um, so that's really how I test a lot of our food is on our, on our staff um, to make sure gluten-free or non-gluten-free that it's still really delicious products. Okay, so we are going to make our crab cakes. And I, unfortunately, am allergic to crab. I was really disappointed that I developed this allergy later in my life. Um, so I have had the opportunity to eat it, and I know that crab can really be um, very sweet in flavor, and I also know that it can be very flavorless at times. So what I would recommend is um, trying to source a blue crab for this um, recipe. I would also suggest um, not breaking the bank. You do not need jumbo lump on this. Um, I use a super lump um, only because I'm at the restaurant and I'm making crab cakes out of this as well, but you can use a lump crab meat. I would stay away from special and I would stay away from claw just because you're not gonna get that sweet crab flavor. You're gonna get a little bit more of the intense crab flavor. So we are about 47 seconds out on our breadcrumbs. And these are nice and golden brown. So I'm going to let these cool. 
Now, if you have noticed that you have gone a touch too far on the cooking process on whatever, croutons, breadcrumbs, you name it, take it off of the hot sheet tray as quickly as you possibly can. Because right now we have carryover cooking. So you can leave it there and then you come back and the bottoms are still gonna be burnt. So just a, a tip for you all when you're, when you're cooking. And while I'm over here, I'm going to check my croutons. I'm gonna shake them up. Now when I'm making croutons at home and I'm not making this many, I really like to flip them over because I don't know if you can see, but when you flip them, you really get a, a nice golden crust on them like this. And that's really desirable. So if I was making these croutons for tonight's, consum con tonight's consumption, I would undercook them slightly because I like my croutons to be this um, crunchy texture. I like a little bit of bite that's in there, but I don't like them to be super dusty. So that's why I, I like them. I tell you, I'm eating a gluten-free crouton right now. <laughs> you gave me the recipe for it. Oh my goodness, is it good. Oh, good. You can't buy a box of croutons. It's, those things are just awful. I think gluten-free croutons are the way to go. This is so darn good. Good. And it's really about the season, the seasoning. You have to apply enough seasoning for this. Okay, so we're going to start with the mayonnaise. And then I'm going to add my seasonings. I have kosher salt, black pepper, and Old Bay. And, you know, growing up on the uh, Delaware border uh, in Pennsylvania, um, we've become a fan of Old Bay. So then I'm also going to add my lemon juice. And I'm creating something called a seasoned mayonnaise. Um, now this seasoned mayonnaise can be used in a lot of different applications. You know, sometimes I'll change the Old Bay out to um, just a little bit of some more fresh lemon zest and use that for lobster rolls. But this is my crab cake base recipe. Now I am, it's very important the method of how you add these ingredients. And whenever we're training new prep cooks, I'm very passionate about talking about this because if I was to just dump everything in here, then I would have pockets of flavor. Kind of like what I was talking about with the bread pudding and making sure you add the ginger and the cinnamon to the sugar to kind of bust it up. It's the same thing here. Now I know I have equal um, distribution of all of my ingredients. So, I opened the can, that's all that I did. Now, depending upon how, how juicy it is, you can lightly squeeze it if you choose to. Um, I don't wanna take too much out because moisture is still really good. Now, if this was really wet, I would take the majority of that out because it's just gonna make your um, crab cakes and crab stuffing uh, loose and pretty wimpy. So now I'm going to take my crab meat. You can see the nice big uh, lumps on top. I'm gonna add that. I'm going to gently bust up the crab because you know, you're paying for this beautiful lump. You don't wanna just shred it out and not have that texture as you're eating your stuffed crabs. So now I'm just going to fold it all together. And if I was to add my breadcrumbs to the mayonnaise mixture, I would have a soggy mess because the second you add bread to your wet mix, it starts to absorb it. So now I'm going to add my six tablespoons of cooled down breadcrumbs to my mix. And I'm just going to stir it on up. Chef, do you usually eat gluten free or doesn't it matter? It doesn't matter. I'm, you know, I, uh, I don't eat gluten-free regularly, but I also don't eat a lot of um, breads and flours, you know. Um, I try to eat whole ingredients and whole foods. With I the can't with the snacks in between. This is, they are just amazing. Wonderful. I'm still crunching on the darn things. It's like one of those things you put in your mouth and taste and then you can't stop eating them. These that's how, that's how I get too. Mm. Put that right over there. And I'm gonna pull our croutons out now. And there they are. Now, I will warn you that's gonna be very hot, so I would not put your mouth in there until they cool down a little bit, because that oil does um, resonate on them. So 
the crab stuffed mushrooms. It's funny where I grew up. Um, it's, it's also known as the mushroom capital of the world, Kennett Square. And I never realized how fortunate I was until I left all the culinary delights that I left behind. Had to be um, in Pennsylvania, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so these are our crab stuffed mushrooms. And I like to use a cremini mushroom. You can use a white mushroom as well. Um, I just think the meatiness of the cremini mushroom um, just holds up a lot better, especially if you're using these as a past hors d'oeuvre. Um, I, I just really enjoy them. So when you get a mushroom, you don't want to soak your mushrooms in water because a mushroom is a sponge. It's just gonna absorb that. And then as you go to cook it, it's just gonna fall apart. So what I like to do is just take a clean towel and just brush them. They make mushroom brushes just for the same, same thing. Would the crab filling that you've mixed also work as a crab cake? It sure would. It sure would. Good. And, um, you know, we use at the restaurant, we use a third cup measure. And I just take the third cup measure and I put a bag in the third cup measure so it's easy to come out. And then I just pop it out right here. And then that's really the crab cake that I use at the restaurant. And then we just, I, you, can, you can use your um, breadcrumbs, your gluten-free breadcrumbs. I use a processed gluten-free panko, which sticks on one side. I pop it in the oven, six minutes, and I pull it out. I don't want to overcook my crab because it's such a delicate um, meat. So it doesn't need a long cook time. So when I am looking at the mushrooms, I want to destem them. And I wanted to show you how to do that. So I just take this and I just pop it out. It's, it's firm but gentle, and you're just removing the stem like that. When they're smaller like this, you just go a little further down and closer to the, the cap and just pull it out. This also works really well if you wanted to make this into an entree and put it into a portabella. The only thing I would do different in the portabella is that I would scrape the gills out of the top so it, dis it doesn't discolor everything. So then the way that I stuff the crab the, into the mushrooms is I use a tablespoon. And this recipe, the one pound of um, crab is going to yield you about 30 stuffed mushrooms, okay? And some mushrooms are larger than others, so some might take a little bit more and some might take a little bit less, and that's okay, just you know, distribute them throughout. Um, what I did prior to you sh showing up was I stuffed a lot of them so you weren't watching me just stuff them. But anything that you do in a repetitive motion at the restaurant, we like to do it in batches. So I would go through and make all of my one, one ounce stuffing balls. And then I would go back and then I would stuff them all into the caps just so that I have um, efficiency in my actions. Is there another way that you could, if somebody had a shellfish allergy, use maybe cod or something like that? Yeah, you can use, you can use fish. You can make it like a fish stuffing. You would not use raw fish though. You would actually um, lightly poach your fish and then flake it. Um, so that's really for the shellfish allergies if they were to do it. If I was to do a shellfish allergy, I probably would actually switch directions and make um, like a spinach and artichoke stuffing for this um, instead of trying to replicate a seafood um, or a fish option. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. And we are coming to the end of our stuffing. Now, um, I like to use a little white wine in this um, because it is a flavor enhancer for the mushrooms as it, it is absorbs and kind of creates a little moisture in the bottom of the pan. But you can also use water if you um, choose not to use um, any alcohol. That's not a problem either. I have somebody who's called, who's written in and said, Burton's is the only restaurant we feel safe at. And my oh. eight year old with celiac absolutely loves the focaccia. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Somebody we, asked, do you have some suggestions for what, what you do with the stems of the mushrooms? Um, if you wanted to, you could save the stems and make them into a vegetable stock. You could also um, utilize these and chop them up if you wanted to do a mushroom stuffing as well. So then I'm going to take my um, hard cheese. You can use... Um, I'm using an American grana. You can use grana padana, you can use Parmesan Reggiano, or manchego is another really good nutty cheese. Um, I would stay away from a cheddar cheese because it really overpowers the crab. So you're not looking to dump so much on that it masks flavor. 
but you're looking to accent the flavor. So I'm just going to shred. And this, this is a really great holiday pleaser. Um, and again, all of this can pretty much be made the day before. The mushrooms can even be stuffed. I wouldn't top them with cheese until I'm ready to put them in the oven though. And what kind of wine do you suggest? Is it more of a dry white? We use a, um, a cooking Chardonnay in the restaurant. Okay. And it's not anything that's gonna break the bank. I would tell you that. Please don't spend a lot of money on it. <laughs> and I'm going to add my wine. And when I add the wine, I'm not looking to pour it over and ruin everything that I just did. I wanna pour it just on the side and allow the distribution to come through. Now this one is going to cook at a higher temperature. I'm looking at cooking this at 450 degree convection oven. I know that um, our standard ovens don't really get higher than 450 degrees in the house, so I would keep it at 450. But if you're noticing that it's not browning on top, just switch it to a broiler low and just kind of get a little bit of that cheese melt browning on there. Going in the 450 degree oven. Now while I'm over here, I notice that I have 40, 34 seconds on the bread pudding. So I'm going to take the bread pudding out and take a look at it. And you can see how it's spongy, okay? I'm gonna just take a peek and I don't see any liquid coming up. So I feel good that this bread pudding is ready to roll. So I'm going to set it out to cool for us now. The crab is going to go in the oven. And I'm gonna set my timer for six minutes. Now, while the timer's set, I'm going to teach you how to make a velouté. A velouté is one of the five mother sauces, and it is really creating a roux. And this is going to be a springboard for any home cook to create um, any type of soup that they want. Um, and this is a thickened soup. Um, some people will finish it with cream, some people won't. Um, you can use this with different stocks if you wanted to use fish stock, clam stock to make a fish chowder or a clam chowder. Um, I use this base to make a cream of chicken soup at the restaurant. So what I'm gonna do is uh, turn on my induction burner and I'm going to melt my butter. Now, roux is a French term, and it means red. Um, and you can have a bunch of different types of roux, you know, um, different degrees of darkness. Um, if you're making a gumbo, you really want to cook that roux down to a deep brown roux. Um, we're not going for that today. We're going for a, um, a more of a blonde roux. But we are going to want to cook it for about five minutes because you need to cook that flour out. I have my chicken broth over here, and you can see the nice fat on the top from it. Fat to me is flavor, so I know this is gonna be rich and delicious. Um, I also dropped a bouquet, uh, bouquet garni in, which is um, the herbs that are called the poultry pack at your supermarket, thyme, sage, and rosemary. I did not use all the rosemary because I find that very overpowering, and I used about a half of the thyme. And I, when I was making my stock, I just heated it up, dropped that in, and that's infusing the flavors in there. So my butter is starting to melt. I have a question that came in on the crab cakes again. Yeah. Um, if they're gonna make crab cakes, is that best to cook on a griddle or is it you put it in the oven? Personal preference. So we use the oven for efficiency at the restaurants. So we put a dash of oil on our um, on a sizzle plate, and then we um, put the crab cake with the um, the gluten free panko on the bottom of it, touching the oil. We put that in a uh, 450 degree oven, and we set the timer for six minutes. When it comes out, we then flip it and leave it on that sizzle plate, that hot sizzle plate, until it has a pickup time. But that's created a nice golden toasty brown on top. If you want to do it on a um, griddle, you totally can. It just is more finesse, and I would recommend using a spatula like this to flip it over. Okay, so now my butter is nice and melted, and I'm going to add my flour. Now I'm using an all-purpose rice-based flour here because I'm looking for that silky smooth. 
as I mentioned at Burton's, we try to feed the masses. So I did not want to create a brown, um, I'm sorry, a, uh, a nut flour or anything that would um, alienate people from eating a wide variety of our foods. So I look for texture um, and I'm looking for that nice, silky, smooth flour texture. Now I'm gonna cook this for five minutes. I'm gonna just turn my heat down a smidge. And I really wanna get into those corners, okay? Now the tricky part of roux is, is when you add the stock, okay? So you're not gonna just dump everything in. You need to slowly add the, add the stock to incorporate into the roux and you're gonna get some um, steam coming up. This roux is extremely hot. Do not dip your finger in it. Do not try to taste it. Just let it do its trick of thickening your sauce and enjoy the flavor afterwards. Um, I remember in culinary school, that was the, the trick. Taste the roux. No, don't do that. So I'm just kind of working it. Do you have suggestions for how to cook a very flavorful stock? Oh, you know, um, you, uh, the trick is to really use a little bit of a uh, base at the back end. I know that's kind of counterproductive of what we always talk about, but you can only extract so much flavor from bones. So unless you really want to spend a lot of money on a lot of bones um, with a little bit of liquid and a little bit of results, I would say add a little bit of um, base because that has that sodium content in it that you're looking for. Um, and some of the bases have that richness in there. Are you using onions and carrots? As yes. Well. So yeah, so you would use your mirepoix. So you would take your bones, your carrots, your onions, your celery, black pepper, uh, bay leaves, I have a touch of salt that goes in there, um, cold water. You always want to use cold water because that's going to create a clear stock. If you were to put hot water in, it'll create a cloudy stock. And then you want to slowly bring that temperature up to a rolling boil and then turn it down to a simmer. And then throughout the process, it's something called depoulage, which is a French term which means to skim the top because you'll start to see some foam um, and some of it doesn't look so pleasant. So you skim it off and then you throw it away. And once but, it's made, that can, extra can go in the freezer, can it? Absolutely. And I, you know, I made two quarts today because um, you know, at our Thanksgiving table, when we want to have leftovers the next day, everybody's like, there's no more gravy. So <laughs> make enough gravy to last two meal periods. And you can make this several days ahead, right? You can make this several days ahead and then heat it up. Now, if I was making a soup um, that I wanted some vegetables or something other flavor in there, I would melt the butter and I would add a little bit additional fat into it, uh, more, more butter. Or if I wanted to use olive oil, I could use olive oil in this roux as well. And then I would um, saute my onions, saute my vegetables, carrots, onions, um, celery, garlic. And then once those get to be nice and sweated, then I dust my flour over that and I create that roux with the vegetables in there, okay? Um, that's what we do at the restaurant for all of our um, soups. I find that once you have that basic stock, that even a couple of days after you can start putting the leftovers from your refrigerator in it, that's what my mother-in-law used to do. And uh, we'd have wonderful soups just using what was left over in the fridge. Absolutely. The refrigerator soup, it's the best kind that's out there. <laughs> so now while well, we're just kind of, I'm gonna turn this down a little bit so I don't lose focus on that, but I wanted to show you the crab stuffed mushrooms that came out. Now what I would do is I would just gently um, take a couple of them for presentation purposes, if you wanted to display them and just put them on a nice platter Now, garnishing is everybody's personal preference, whatever they do or don't do. So my personal preference would be to take a little bit of some chive and just add a little bit of green color to that. Oh, that looks so good. I'll take them and put them right over here next to our bread pudding. Chef Denise, are you actually cooking at a restaurant or are you just... Um... No, I, I hung up my hat a few years back now, um, and I oversee uh, the food and beverage operation for the, for the Burton's Grill. 
So everybody's I, asking if you could cook for them. <laughs> <laughs> My husband asks me that a lot too. <laughs> It's funny, I think once you marry a chef, they stop cooking for everybody at home. <laughs> so I'm just gonna bring my roux back up to temperature so that you get to see the, um, the thickening process that happens. Okay, so I have some bubbling happening here and my timer has gone off for my five minute. And I'm going to slowly add my stock. You can see it reacting and thickening. You can see how I am constantly adding it. Now I've stopped adding it because I wanted to make sure that it doesn't rhubarb up on me, which means that I get um, really thick balls in there. So now I'm gonna add a little bit more and I'm gonna use my whisking arm, a little bit more. So if I was gonna be making my stock the day before and then adding it um, the next day, I would actually bring my stock up to temperature. I would, I would not put cold stock in a hot roux. You either want to have a room temperature or you want to have a warm one. See how it's coming together right there? Nice and smooth. Now I'm going to add just a touch more. So it's kind of like when you're making uh, Caesar dressing. You have to add the oil slowly and then as you get more and more oil into it you can speed the oil process up. Somebody had asked that uh, most soup bases at other restaurants would contain gluten, wouldn't they? Maybe at times do they put flour on the bones when they start to brown them in so the oven? Some of them do and that's a beef one and um, so anybody that presents any food for me from a manufacturer, they know the first question I'm on, out of my mouth is going to be, is that gluten-free? So I have sourced a no MSG, no gluten-free, I'm sorry, a gluten-free um, base that I, that I use at the restaurants. And that's again a wholesale product? Um, that is a wholesale product, yes. So now, depending upon the thickness that you're looking for, because soups and gravies will vary in, in thickness, you can add more stock or you can add less stock, okay? But what you really wanna do is um, bring the stock up to a boil just to incorporate all the flavors together. So I'm gonna go for kind of a thinner gravy because I'm actually making soup. Um, and there I go. Now, they also make another product out there, which is called, um, it, it's like a, a, a kitchen browning sauce. Mm -hmm. um, now, if I was making a uh, gravy, I would use that, okay? Um, I'm going to season this with a little bit of salt and pepper. Now, when I'm making a, a, a blonde soup, I will use white pepper, okay? And white pepper can be very powerful. So add cautiously. I, wouldn't, I, would, I would rather add to it than have to try to take it away. I'm just gonna bring that up to a simmer. Now I'm gonna just show you kind of that, that browning sauce. This also has a little bit of flavor in it too, which is more of that poultry seasoning thyme flavor profile. So I'm just gonna add a drop. Yeah, it doesn't take much, does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> There you go. There we go. And now I'm just going to get a tasting spoon. I'm going to taste my food. Fantastic. Mm, nice and rich. And you, you do get the butter to come through on that roux. So that's it's really nice when that happens. So I'm just going to bring that up. I'm gonna add just a touch more salt because I don't know, I think when you cook longer, you like salt more. I don't know what it is, but the two go hand in hand. Okay, let me get my croutons back in the picture. And I don't know about you, but tomato soup and croutons with a little bit of fresh Parmesan cheese is like, mmm, my go to comfort food, warm meal. So, um, so then I'm gonna take my soup because I'm 
being aware of timing right now. I'll lay it all into my bowl. I will garnish with a few croutons that will float on top. And then again, I would like to garnish with my chive for added color. Beautiful. And that, my friends, can be soup, can be gravy. So many possibilities are out there for you. That's really wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My goodness. I didn't have my bowl of croutons. It's embarrassing. <laughs> when I um, was preparing these recipes for this presentation, um, I took these croutons and I put them in a, um, like a freeze tight container and I put these croutons in my freezer and they worked really well. Mm. Um, if you do have extra croutons, you can also process these down and make breadcrumbs out of those too. So really just kind of thinking about what you have and where you want to go with it. Um, there's so many different possibilities on, on how to cut, divide, and, and reuse and repurpose your ingredients. So I hope you, you found this useful today. The price of bread being so ridiculously high for people with celiac disease, I think it's $8 a loaf in many places. Being able to see all the different things so we don't waste one crumb is just wonderful. Thank you. You're very welcome. Now, do we have any more questions that are coming our way? Well, I think for many people, they've said that these basic recipes are just starting the creative process for many people, and they're excited about that. So uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, and, and one thing I want to mention about the croutons, too, is there's a salad called, called a panzanella salad, and I'm sure a lot of gluten-free um, uh, diners don't get to eat it. So when the, your tomatoes are really ripe and we just passed that, it's so delicious to take like a pesto vinaigrette, toss your croutons in the pesto vinaigrette and then toss your freshly diced tomatoes with a little bit of salt and pepper on them and maybe some burrata or some fresh mozzarella and you create this really delicious soft and crunchy bread salad um, that I'm sure you, you really don't ever get to experience. I think that's true. There are um, a lot of people are asking if you'd open a restaurant in California <laughs> <laughs> and um, do you have any lo uh, locations that are Oh, I know somebody wanted to know if you had focaccia bread um, at all your Burton's restaurants? So not at all of them. And, um, you know, we used to serve a local gluten-free focaccia um, in our northern New England restaurants. However, with the, you know, pandemic happening, we had halted um, all of our bread service because it was really a communal um, station in our restaurants. So trying to navigate through, you know, the pandemic and what's happened and what's not. Um, we're going to see about what comes of to 2021 in all honesty for some of these options that we've had. But I will always keep gluten-free pasta, gluten-free burger buns. I'll never go back on the gluten-free flour. Um, so as we continue to evolve our recipes, um, same thing with Red Heat Tavern, they make a Chex Mix um, that they give out for road snacks that on, on all of their takeout menu, um, takeout bags um, and dining guests. And it's made with gluten-free pretzels. And we just take a lot of care in making sure that we're sourcing menu items that feed everybody. You know, we don't want you to have to question and ask, is it gluten-free or not? They're also asking if you would do a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> I might. That's the second time somebody's asked me that. So that's a, that's a good one to, uh, you know, ponder on. <laughs> yeah. There is a poll up for people to answer. We hope you will take the time to answer them. So we better we get a better idea of who you are out there and uh, who's tuning in with us. But this has been great. And my mouth is so full of croutons, I can't tell you. It's just <laughs> been the best thing ever. It would be a great snack for kids. It would be just wonderful. I, I'm really thrilled, really fun stuff. Somebody asked if your Peabody, Massachusetts location reopened. It and has not. Um, we, were, we were looking to move our business um, to Linfield because our 10 year lease had expired um, at the end of September. So unfortunately due to COVID, it had accelerated the closing of that restaurant. And then it also prolonged the opening of it. We will be opening in um, the Market Street in Linfield in 2021. Um, we're just not sure of when that time frame is gonna happen, so. Fair enough. And somebody asked, um, do you cook gluten-free pasta in a separate pasta yes. water? Yes, so we, um, we 
yes, we, we cook it in a separate pasta water and then we reheat it in a separate pasta water as well. Um, you know, I, I, I used a purple spatula today, but purple is the color in our restaurant of how we signify allergies. So at Burton's, if you come into the restaurant and you're at, um, at the front door, we ask you if you care for a gluten-free menu or a gluten men um, or regular menu. And asking for the gluten-free menu will signify the purple card procedure where your server then writes every one of your menu items that you've ordered on a purple card they go to the expediter, they go to the manager, they notify the kitchen, that purple card then follows that item back out to the guest. We have special plateware that we plate the food on, um, which is a, a square style plate as opposed to our round plates in the restaurant to signify that it is an allergy friendly. And it's not just for gluten anymore because we've become very, very popular for a wide variety of allergies. So it's really our allergy protocol um, that our servers and our kitchen staff go through extensive training. Um, we've also created a master ingredient list for every one of our menu items. And since we have restaurants down to Florida and multiple distributors, we have all those different manufacturers ingredients at a single touch of an Excel spreadsheet that our servers can pull it up on an iPad. Um, they can even bring the iPad over to the guest so the guest can view the ingredients as well. And that's been very helpful. Um, what I have found for our success is providing the knowledge to our service staff and providing the tools um, to them and our, and our kitchen employees has really made it more of a seamless transaction between the, the allergy guest and the experience um, because they have all the information at their fingertips. Um, we always say when in doubt, don't serve it, but we've gotten to the point now that we always take pictures of labels, we post them, we put them up on our website, not on our website, on our internal um, SharePoint. So everybody um, has to sign off on an allergy commitment um, when, they, when they get hired with Burton's because they know the severity of it. Um, they, we all understand that it's life and death for some individuals. Um, and you know, it's one of the reasons I never brought a peanut in the restaurant. Uh, for you know, 15 years, we've never had a peanut in our restaurant. That's great, awesome. Well, we love how, how you think of this and how you provide for us and for celiacs, it's like a warm hug. We really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Lynn. I appreciate it. <laughs> and honestly, I've appreciated our relationship over the years as well. So I it's agree. been really great to work with um, different organizations that really have a strong community. Um, and that, that's really awesome that you can continue to provide that for your community. Thank you. I agree. Um, someone asked about an air fryer. How does that fit with gluten-free food? Any idea? So an air fryer is really what you put into it. Um, so if you put something that's gluten-free into it, it will come out um, fine too. I don't have a lot of experience with an air fryer, but um, I have heard different people talking about it, um, that it, it's, it doesn't create gluten. Um, so that's, that's different. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the polls and uh, it looks like most people who are watching, 50% have had celiac disease for over 10 years. And, uh, and the next group was two to nine years. So the people have been living with this disease for quite a while and still interested in cooking. I think it takes a long time to figure out how to become a gluten-free recipe holder. It, it's a tough one. It is, and you know, that, that's something that, as I got into cooking, I used to say I love seeing the smiles on people's faces, but to hear the stories of the allergy communities that come and can dine in our restaurant safely and the children that have never eaten in a restaurant before that can come to Burton's, I just, I get emotional about it because it's so awesome and amazing that we can provide that for this community. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of that and what the team has accomplished over the years. Absolutely, I agree. The second question that went out there as a poll is what do you think is the most difficult holiday dish to make gluten-free? And um, number one was breads. Of course, we aren't doing a cooking show on making yeast breads today, but there are a lot of regular baking powder breads that are pretty good, like date nut, orange, and things like that. But the second thing that's difficult is stuffing, which we went over today, which is kind of nice that that came up because that has been difficult for a lot of people. And I know for many, they come into a, um, a dinner and what a surprise if it can be all, all gluten-free. It certainly is in our house. Nobody tastes the difference. They, they get it. They understand it. And I think you've shown people that it can be done, which is exciting. Yeah, and it's, a, it's about seasonings. A lot of it is. And yep. I'll have to adapt a gluten-free um, stuffing because my mother has an awesome stuffing recipe that um, is mashed potato-based. 
um, which really helps with the moisture. So it keeps it very moist, which will probably lend very well to a gluten-free um, bread application in that. Interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of cool. Are there any tips for pies? Um, you know, sometimes making the pie crust is tough. It is. Um, you know, there have been some really good um, gluten-free oats and some gluten-free um, graham crackers out there. So we make a key lime pie and we have played with um, the same person that makes our gluten-free focaccia. They make gluten-free um, graham crackers. So we'll process the graham crackers and then we'll process some of the gluten-free granola up. And then I add a little bit of butter to that. And that's what I would use as my pie crust. Yeah, I agree. I think it's better. I know for an apple pie in our house, we do the apples. We do no crust, but we put a streusel topping on it. And that hot out of the oven with some ice cream works pretty well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Add ice cream to anything. I mean, caramel sauce, ice cream, whipped cream to the bread pudding um, really, really can take it to the next level. Yeah, I think that's great. Terrific. Um, one other thing was someone said, would you recommend baking the French bread first or is it okay straight out of the shrink wrap or thawed from the freezer? For what application? For croutons or for? I would think so. No, I actually use that right out of the shrink wrap because if I was to um, toast it and then try to cut it up, um, I would have uh, more crummy bread. So I wanted to create that texture within my crouton. Um, it's not, if you, you wanted to serve that bread for dinner and you have it toasted, um, I would probably use it later and see how the texture is, but you might be able to turn those into croutons once it's had a time to kind of cool down and soften a little bit. That's a great idea. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, again, they want to know about your Peabody, Massachusetts opening. They want to know about your cookbook. It's all coming through here. <laughs> <laughs> Gluten-free focaccia, can we all buy it, please? <laughs> Um, I guess that's pretty popular. It is, yes. <laughs> uh, well, I really appreciate that. I think uh, I don't have any questions that are coming up right now. I think we've gone through our poll. So uh, I appreciate this day with everybody. It's really been wonderful. Please note that the slide that comes up at the end is talking about our next two series that are coming up in November and December. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. And my heartfelt thanks to Chef Denise for doing such a wonderful job today. It's really been terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.